by connecting to the cloud server. And Oleg's already said that he likes our, our uh, uh, Facebook stream. So there we go. We've got a, a vote of, uh, of support from Oleg uh, from um, Norway. Um, so I'm recording now and I'm going to uh, start the uh, webinar now. So uh, you've got, there's four minutes to the start. Um, so Zakur, it's uh, over to you now. We're now live. Yeah. We started chat for you know. Ruth. So we're live now. You're live. Okay. So if you could uh, just a tick, my wife's just got to mute her her computer here. Could you just turn the volume off? I've just got to go and help. Hello, we've got some chat in the chat room. So, uh, Zakur, uh, we've got another three minutes. We've got a few people coming in. Amanda Howe. Uh, welcome, Amanda. Yes. Uh, welcome uh, to Drip Pop. Yeah, yeah. So, we're just all assembling at the moment. Uh, it's lovely to see people starting to, uh, to come in. We've got 26 participants. So, uh, uh, we'll just wait for... Um, those who are registered to be able to come in. While we're doing that, just to note, we've got over 400 registrants uh, for this. So uh, hopefully a large number of those people will be able to join us. So. Hello everyone, greetings from Bangladesh. And uh, very shortly we will start. So, can I start, Ruth? Zakur, we've got 31 participants. I think you should leave it till shortly after um, the hour, just to make sure oh. that we're not starting before those that want to join yeah. um, can. Um, we've got uh, uh, Ian Cooper, I notice, um, and uh, Ruth Opp from Bhutan, welcome. Welcome, Professor Kanabala, too. Yeah, Kanabala is here. Yeah, I think just. And uh, we have Dr. Abu Sayyid also here. So, uh, Bruce, just tell me when it's uh, right time to start. I think we'll just wait for a few more participants to join us, uh, Zakur. So uh, uh, we've got uh, quite a few coming in at the moment. We've got quite a lot registered. So we'll uh, maybe if we just give them a, a minute or two to, uh, to just join us and then we can uh, go from there. Hello, Sadia. You don't need to join with us. Hello, Sadia. You don't need to join with us. Ian Cooper's just noticed that the chat is set to go to the panelists only. Um, uh, we can certainly, uh, uh, you can choose the option set to panelists and attendees uh, 
So please feel free to do that. Uh, Bruce is Roger here. I'm hearing an echo. <laughs> yeah, sorry, hear, hear. that was that was Facebook. My apologies. I was uh, I had Facebook on that screen and me on this screen. So just so everyone knows, there's a uh, uh, a live feed on Facebook. So uh, if uh, anyone uh, is having trouble with the webinar themselves, you can go to uh, Rural Wonka and uh, and join in there so the blood okay um we've we've got about 46 participants so i think we should start going so i'll hand That's over right, yeah. yeah whenever you're ready uh if everyone else could uh, mute their microphones that would be great over yeah, to you meet your microphone and Greetings from Bangladesh on behalf of 17th Onka World Rural Health Conference. It's now on stage. All set for you. So I hand over to today's master of the ceremony, Moinuddin Hoftukusha. Please go ahead, Moinuddin. Greetings from Bangladesh on behalf of 17th Onka World Rural Health Conference 2020 Dhaka, Bangladesh. I would like to welcome you all from home and abroad. Uh, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Professor Roger Stretcher, founding chair, Onka Working Party on Rural Health, topic on <coughs> training for rural practice 25 years onward and upward. Before our keynote speech, let's have a glimpse of on beautiful Bangladesh on the screen. Let's we enjoy it. Thank you all. Amar Shonar Bangla. Bangladesh has been marching towards success against all odds since the liberation of 1971. Our story is the story of relentless progress. We have made several achievements in the health sector. By reducing child mortality of five years and below five years and improving maternal health, Bangladesh has fulfilled the Millennium Development Goals ahead of time. However, Bangladesh had to strive to cross a long road to come to this position. For any kind of medical treatment, villagers had to come to town. With the dream to deliver healthcare at every doorstep of the masses in the remote areas of the country, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina started the community clinic in 1998 under the Health and Population Sector Program. So far, over 50 million people have benefited with care from community clinics and this number is still growing. With the contribution of land and active participation from the locals and with the technical support from the government, 13,450 community clinics now give service to almost 5,40,000 people daily. Its value is growing with time. Overall management and promotion of the community clinic is catered by the local inhabitants. The government provides a community health care provider, a family welfare assistant, and a health assistant through six weeks theoretical and six weeks practical training along with the necessary medicines. Every day from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. the following services are provided. Treatment of minor ailments, common diseases and first aid. 
screening of chronic and non-communicable diseases, integrated management of childhood illness, expanded program on immunization, nutritional education and micronutrient supplements, health education and counseling, reproductive health and family planning services. There are also other programs for maternal and neonatal healthcare services. ঘরের কাছে কমিউনিটি ক্লিনিক থাকায় এখন সবাই সহজে এখান থেকে সেবা নিতে পারছে আমার বাচ্চা অনেক জ্বর হয়েছিল তো এই জায়গায় থেকে ওষুধ নিয়ে খাওয়ানোর পর এখন অনেক সুস্থ কমিউনিটি ক্লিনিক হেলথ কেয়ার নিয়ার হোম লিভ হেলদি থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ অল আই উড লাইক টু ইনভাইট আওয়ার কিন্ড স্পিকার Professor Roger Stretcher, founding chair, Onka, <coughs> working party on rural health, tropics on training for rural practice, 25 years onwards and upwards. Please, Roger, go ahead, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zakir, and uh, thank you for that, that introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can uh see my slides so you should be able to see my slides now and as you've heard my the topic for my opening keynote address for the 17th world rural health conference is training for rural practice 25 years onward and upward i do want to start by saying this is an enormous uh, privilege and a great pleasure for me to be, to be with you today. And I want to congratulate Bruce Chater and all the, the Rural Wonka team and especially Zakir and the team in, in Bangladesh for uh, bringing us all together in this way uh, for uh, the 17th Wonka World Rural Health Conference. I think it's fair to say as, as the COVID-19 pandemic was, was starting to take hold uh, uh, and the the planned conference in April had to be uh, postponed. We weren't quite sure how it was going to happen, but a, a great effort by so many uh, in Bangladesh and around the world has brought us together uh, today for, for the opening of this conference. And uh, I, I expect a really exciting next uh, three days from Bangladesh and then a series of, of uh, seminars uh, over the coming months, all part of the 17th Wonka World Rural Health Conference. So welcome everyone, a great opportunity for us to get together uh, uh, virtually uh, for this conference. And I think we have much uh, that's very exciting to talk about and to share. So my part of the conference in this initial keynote address is to, to look backwards and then to look forward. So it's actually 25 years ago this year that the Wonka World Council approved the first rural Wonka policy, the policy on training for rural practice. What I'm going to do briefly is set the scene and then talk about what we know now that we didn't know then 25 years ago uh, in terms of rural health and rural practice, uh, the experience of implementing training for rural practice and also about recruitment and retention of the rural health workforce. So I have no uh, conflicts of interest to declare, uh, but I will tell you a little bit about myself. My background is in Australia as a rural general practitioner, family physician. I was uh, practicing about two hours east of Melbourne in the southeast part of Australia for nearly 20 years. And during that time, I also was appointed as the first professor of rural health in Australia and the head of the, what became the Monash University School of Rural Health, which was a sort of uh, rural branch of the, of the big city medical school of Monash University in Melbourne. And then in 2002, the opportunity came to, to go to Canada and to join others in establishing the Northern Ontario School of Medicine as a multi-site rural-based uh, medical school. And I was there as the founding dean and CEO uh, until last year. And, uh, and now I'm actually speaking to you from New Zealand, where I'm the professor of rural health at the University of Waikato. And during that time, and particularly between 1992 and 19 and sorry, 2004, I was the inaugural chair of the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice. The Working Party on Rural Practice uh, was formed 
following a get a gathering of rural practitioners attending uh, the, the 1992 Wonka World Conference in Vancouver. There are a whole lot of us there and we were really seeing the need for a much greater focus and a lot of work to do to improve uh, rural health and, and rural practice. And so uh, we got together over a, a, at a lunch break during that conference and that led to establishing the, the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice, which has gone from strength to strength over the years. Uh, with rural policies, with the conferences like, like this one, statements and collaboration with the World Health Organization. Uh, this, I think, uh, the photograph uh, in a way sums up uh, the working party. You'll see, uh, well, you can see this, this was actually at the conference that we held in, in, uh, in Nigeria in 2008. And, and uh, we were, uh, the group of us here were being installed as honorary chiefs. Uh, this, so this is me, you recognize me, you recognize Bruce Chater, the current chair of, of Rural Wonka, and this is Ian Cooper, who was at the time uh, the chair of Rural Wonka from, from uh, South Africa. So this is what I'm talking about, the, uh, the, the Wonka policy on training for rural practice, and you can see that it's been reprinted and redesigned uh, three times, but it was 1995 when when the policy was formally approved, and so it's 25 years on, that we're looking at what we know and where, and where we're going really in, with training for rural practice around the world. This slide is the beginning of just drawing your attention to the key recommendations in the policy. So uh, highlighting that there was recognized a worldwide shortage of, of, of rural doctors and the need really to have a specific uh, interventions that would actually improve uh, training for rural practice. And you can see the recommendations, the first five of them there, uh, particularly about uh, recruiting students from, from the, a rural background, providing rural undergraduate medical education, training for rural practice after graduation, continue education, professional development for rural practitioners, uh, academic roles for rural practitioners, and for the, rural, for the medical schools themselves to take on a, a role, a commitment to serve uh, regions, uh, that, a, a specific region, including the, the rural and remote parts of the region and, and connecting with the real the health needs of the population of that region. So that's the notion of social accountability. And it was actually in 1995, that, that year, that the World Health Organization uh, provided the definition that, that is still uh, really the guiding light for social accountability of medical schools and other health professional education institutions. Uh, the, the remaining recommendations were about the, the importance uh, of recognizing that rural practitioners and their families need to, to be part of the community and need to be supported. Uh, and, and for all of this to happen uh, in each country, there needed to be a national rural health strategy. So they, they are the nine key recommendations in the 1995 Wonka policy on training for rural practice. So what do we know now? Well, it was actually in 1996 that we held the first uh, Wonka World Rural Health Conference, and that was in China. And I think for those of us who were there, there were over 300 participants from 30 countries. It was something of a surprise when we realized that although, you know, the countries we came from, the geography, the climate, uh, uh, the, the developed and the, and the, and the less developed, uh, countries, there were so many obvious differences that there was a lot that we really have in common. And in fact, access is the rural health issue. And it's the same everywhere. Even in countries where most of the people live in the rural areas, the resources are concentrated in the cities. There are always transport and communication difficulties between one rural community and the next, and also between the rural and the, and the urban centers. <clears throat> and there are, there have never been, and there's still are not sufficient providers of healthcare, the rural workforce uh, uh, everywhere around the world. We now know and we're able to describe rural practitioners. So when compared to their counterparts in the big cities, rural practitioners may be described as extended generalists. They provide a wider range of services. They carry a higher level of clinical responsibility in relative professional isolation. And that's true whether we're talking about doctors like general practitioners or family physicians, pediatricians, uh, surgeons. It's also true about other members of the health team, nurses, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, uh, physiotherapists. Rural practitioners are extended 
generalists. And also rural practitioners frequently live in the community that they serve. And so they have the opportunity to influence the, com the health of the whole community at a community level. And actually the best example that I know of this is the, is the doctor in a small inland town in South Australia that was so effective in, in presenting the message of the connection between red meat and cholesterol and heart disease that the butcher shop started selling fish. We also know now from extensive research, what are the key parameters of high quality healthcare, rural healthcare. And the first and, and really important point is that the health services that are most successful, most effective in addressing the health needs of people in rural and remote communities are those health service delivery models that are designed in the rural communities by the rural communities for the rural communities taking models from the big cities and somehow trying to modify them and transform them and make them fit into the rural setting just doesn't work. People living in rural communities prefer to be looked after close to home. And I, during my time as a rural practitioner in, in Australia, I twice had, had people choose to go blind rather than travel two hours to the nearest eye specialist. And speaking of specialists, we now know that specialists are really important to high quality rural health care and their role is a supportive role, recognizing that the doctors the nurses, the other members of the health team in the rural communities, they are the frontline providers of all health care. And so the role of the, the, the specialist is the true consultant role, providing support, collaboration, assisting the local providers of care to provide so that, that the people in the rural communities really have high quality health care uh, close to home. We now know that those key parameters that were outlined in the, the uh, policy on training for rural practice, which was aspirational. In 1995, there was some research, but quite limited research and lots of good ideas. Now we know that the three factors most strongly associated with going into rural practice after education and training are first of all, a rural background, that's having grown up in a rural setting. The second factor is positive, and I emphasize the word positive uh, clinical and educational experiences in the rural setting as part of undergraduate medical education. And the third factor is targeted training for rural practice uh, after graduation. And they are the, the, there's, there's now abundant evidence right around the world that these, that these three factors come together, uh, contribute to successful uh, recruitment into rural practice. So we're going to change gears now and talk about uh, Northern Ontario. This, this map that you can see is, is, on, is the province of Ontario in Canada. Um, these are the Great Lakes, excuse me. <coughs> and these are, the, these are uh, the Great Lakes and this is Hudson Bay and James Bay. And this, this vast area, which is largely black, is Northern Ontario, north of the Great Lakes. Uh, and, and this is a population distribution map. So the black just shows that mostly is start sparsely populated. It's almost uh, sorry, over 800,000 square kilometers and almost 800,000 population. There are five population centers with 50,000 or more and all the rest are 10,000 or less. So vast, uh, vast geography uh, with a harsh climate uh, and long distances between small communities, uh, a resource-based economy that's uh, based on, on, on mining, forestry and tourism and the health status of the people is worse than the general population in Ontario and in Canada. So that's the context in which the Northern Ontario School of Medicine uh, was established, uh, opened officially in 2005, expecting, ac accepting the first students in that year. Uh, the school serves as the Faculty of Medicine of two universities, uh, Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Laurentian University in Sudbury. They are 1000 kilometers apart. Uh, and the school was established from the beginning with a social accountability mandate. That's a commitment to improve the health of the people and the communities of Northern Ontario. There's also a commitment to innovation. Distributed community engaged learning is the distinctive model of medical education and health research that we developed in Northern Ontario. Distributed means there are actually over 90 sites where uh, the, the medical students and the, and the trainees and the learners in other health disciplines may undertake part of their, their clinical learning. Those sites are connected electronically 
uh, both in, in, in real time and asynchronously. And we have an extensive uh, digital library service, which means if you have the ac access, if you have the internet, you have access to educational resources and information, pretty much the same as if you're in the big city, like in a, in a teaching hospital environment. But the centerpiece of distributed community engaged learning is, communi is community engagement. That's the interdependent partnerships between the communities and the School of Medicine. And so the, the, the communities and the school work together and, and, and co-created the curriculum that we de deliver in Northern Ontario. So here's the map again of Northern Ontario. It gives you a visual of the over 90 sites and also with the color coding, a sense of the different uh, parts of, of the curriculum for uh, the school, uh, for the undergraduate medical students. Uh, for example, in, in their first year, uh, all students have four weeks uh, living and learning in indigenous communities. That includes these communities that are very remote. You can only get there by airplane, uh, except in, in the winter when they cut ice roads to bring in heavy, heavy equipment. And our students in Northern Ontario School of Medicine, NOSM students have four weeks living and learning in these communities. And this is, an, this is not a clinical experience. This is a community experience. And the students are there to learn from the community about the history, the tradition, uh, the culture, the social and the health issues. So that's in first year. The students have two uh, times uh, four week uh, experiences, clinical experiences in remote and rural communities in second year. And these are small communities and they're there to learn with and from the health team, the, the doctors and the other members of the health team. And then in third year, the students leave the two larger centers of, of uh, Thunder Bay, which is here and Sudbury, which is there. And they go to one of 15 communities in Northern Ontario, and they live in that community for the entire academic year. And they're based in general practice, family practice, and essentially they see patients. So you can say that the curriculum walks through the door, like the first patient might be a child, that's pediatrics, the next patient might be pregnant, that's obstetrics, the next patient might have the surgical problem. This is the principal clinical year for the students, they're learning their core clinical medicine from the community family practice perspective. This is a so-called longitudinal integrated clerkship, uh, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, NOSM was the first medical school in the world where all of the students undertake a longitudinal integrated clerkship, which we call a comprehensive community clerkship because of the active participation of the community. You can see the rest of this slide that um, uh, we have learners in other health disciplines, uh, nutrition, dietetics, physician assistants, and, and other health science learners that are all part of the of the education and training programs of Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So what are the outcomes? Well, first of all, uh, if you think back to those three uh, factors, the first is recruiting students from a rural background. In Northern Ontario, we aim to reflect the population distribution of Northern Ontario in each class. And we've been quite successful. These figures are from the first 10 years of, of intake from 2005 uh, to 2015. Uh, it's very competitive, over 2,000 applications for 64 places. And we've been successful in the sense that 92% of the students have grown up in Northern Ontario. The other 8% come from remote and rural parts of the rest of Canada. So you, that's a very different class profile from the other medical schools in Canada, which are in big cities, and most of the, the students come from the big cities. In fact, 40% of our students come from remote and rural communities, which more or less reflects the demographics of Northern Ontario. 7% Indigenous is lower than we're, our target, which is 12%. And in fact, uh, we, as a result of, of this research, we tweaked the admissions process and, and the intake is now closer to 12% of Indigenous students each year. And Francophones, people for whom French is their home language, is the other population of special interest and 22% is a good reflection of the population. Before we leave this slide, I just want to highlight this other uh, so GPA stands for grade point average, and it's a number out of four. This, this reflects the academic standing of the applicants. And, you know, certainly in the big cities like in Toronto, there was the assumption that we must have lowered the academic standards to allow in all of these dumb northerners. But in fact, 3.7 is about the same as the at intake as the other medical students in, in Canada. So that's the admissions process. Let's now 
share some of what we know from the students' experience. Clearly, the emphasis on rural medicine and, and generalism, and we've, we've done uh, research which, which really is focused on, on our students and our graduates' experience of generalism in, in rural practice. But I think uh, this last one, uh, which I've highlighted, uh, really sums it up. You don't know it until you live it. I think that is the central theme and the, and the, the real basis of the success of Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So here's a quick snapshot of the success. Uh, looking first in the top half of the slide is the graduates from the undergraduate program, the MD program. And you, you can see that 62% of the graduates have chosen to become general practitioners, family physicians, mostly training for rural practice. That's almost double the national average for Canada going into family practice. 33% have chosen other general specialties like general medicine, general surgery, pediatrics. And that leaves 5% who've chosen subspecialties like dermatology, radiation, oncology, neurology. Now that 5% is important to us in Northern Ontario for two reasons. The first is that we need those subspecialists. They have to go elsewhere for their training at the postgraduate level, but they are coming back and so serving Northern Ontario. But the other is that it shows that even though we have a very different curriculum model and learning environment from the other medical schools, our graduates are, are very competitive if they choose to train in a subspecialty, uh, they are generally successful in matching to training in that subspecialty. So that's, that's uh, looking at what happens to the graduates of, of the undergraduate program in Northern Ontario. Uh, in Canada, the medical schools, all only medical schools run postgraduate education, vocational training. And so we can look at the, at the graduates, uh, the re they're called residents, the trainees are called residents in, in North America and that uh, almost 70% of the NOSM graduates uh, of the residency training programs uh, are, are in Northern Ontario. And if you look at those who did their undergraduate and their postgraduate in Northern Ontario, 94% are practicing in Northern Ontario, including in the smaller remote rural communities. So now it's uh, 15 years since the official opening of Northern Ontario School of Medicine and, and NOSM's really made a difference in Northern Ontario. It's not just about more more doctors, but, but actually the whole health team that are responsive to the, so, the social, cultural, linguistic, geographic diversity of Northern Ontario. And there are other benefits in terms of, of research and academic developments and economic development as well. Okay, we're now going to shift gears. So we've looked in broad what we know about uh, rural health and rural practice uh, from research in the last 25 years. We've looked at the specific example of implementing the recommendations from the policy on training for rural practice in Northern Ontario. And now we're going to sort of uh, step back and look at the bigger picture of the recruitment and retention of rural practitioners. And uh, starting in 2008, 2009, uh, the World Health Organization uh, convened a, an expert panel, uh, uh, John Wynne Jones and, and Ian Cooper and I are amongst the members of this expert panel that developed this document launched actually uh, by Ian Cooper in South Africa. Uh, a global policy recommendations increasing access to health workers in remote and rural areas through improved retention. This was a really uh, groundbreaking document at the time and uh, a group, uh, the World Health Organization has recently uh, reconvened a, a group to review uh, additional evidence accumulated in the last 10 years and to, to update uh, these global policy recommendations. This slide actually is, as you can see, is a figure from that document. And, and it recognizes that there are many factors that contribute to, to the, the choice, the decision to, to practice in a rural community. And they are many of them are to do with uh, personal and professional issues, family issues, and, and, the, and the broader environment. And it's important to, to recognize all of those and address all, all of those issues. Uh, the actual World Health Organization policy document has uh, recommendations under four headings and they're the first four dot points on this slide uh, of recruitment and retention strategies. The, uh, 10 years ago and now still the strongest evidence is around education and training and really uh, uh, very strong evidence of the, of the benefits of, of education and training for rural practice consistent with the Wonka policy on training for rural practice from 1995. Other uh, recommendations are about uh, regulations and one sort or another, 
uh, finance, financial and other sort of recognition and reward. And then of course the personal and professional aspects. I would say in the last 10 years, it's become clear that there are these two other key uh, categories of interventions that are important. One is that the health service, the health delivery model itself is actually, is, is actually sustainable and supportive of the rural practitioners. And the other is the, the really essential contribution that the community makes. That's active community participation or community engagement. So I'm now going to share a, a framework that was developed through a partnership around the Arctic Circle, as you can see over seven years with five countries and focusing on uh, recruitment and retention of health and other public sector workers in remote rural communities in the far north of these uh, northern countries in Europe and around the Arctic Circle. And we developed uh, through the Recruit and Retain Making It Work uh, projects, uh, the Remote Rural Workforce Stability Framework. Now this framework has three key tasks, plan, recruit and retain. The first task is plan. And it begins with actually identifying what the health needs are of the population that's to be served as the basis then for designing the health delivery, health service delivery model. And only when you have that information, can you identify, well, what are the, uh, the, the knowledge and the skills, the capabilities of the health workforce that you're looking to recruit? And so planning is a really a critical first task in the process of planning, recruiting and retaining the rural health workforce. So recruiting. One of the really important insights that we gained through this project, and there were, there were case studies in each of the five participating countries, was the importance of information sharing. This isn't just about the job for the, for the potential recruit, it's about the whole community. It's about living and being part of the community. It's about the family, rural practitioners generally relocating to, to a, a rural setting there's a family and the family has to feel at home and want to be in the community with, with the education and the employment and the, and, the, and the social and recreational activities. And once again, that's where the community participation, community engagement is really central to successful recruitment. So having recruited retention, it's so important. And anywhere, not just in, in, in rural communities, uh, it's a supportive work environment. It's being part of a cohesive team that makes uh, healthcare providers, workers more generally, feel that they want to be part of this team and stay in this team and make their contribution uh, to the services that they deliver. It's important that they, that they are supported to develop as a team with professional development at the local level, uh, with, of course, uh, uh, these days, online education and training to keep up to date and funded travel uh, for upskilling and for, for uh, uh, pr professional dis discipline specific uh, uh, continuing education and professional development. And a critical element, a real contributor to success is the active involvement in education and research. Education, research, academic involvement is a real contributor to successful retention. And of course it is about training the next generation of healthcare providers for this rural community and for other rural communities uh, uh, across the region and the world. Now, for plan, recruit and retain to be truly uh, effective, there are these five conditions for success. The first is to recognize that when you've seen one rural community, you've seen run rural community. So those unique aspects that make each community special and, and, uh, and, the, and the, the, the contextual contributions. The next, therefore, is to involve the people in those communities, active community participation, community engagement, as I've mentioned. Success requires dedicated investment, real resources allocated. This is not uh, just to fit in with the existing budget, but actual targeted investment to, to actually be successful in recruitment and retention of uh, the rural health workforce. And this is a continuous work in progress. It's not a one-off set of interventions and then you're done. Uh, it's, it's really important to establish that annual cycle of activities. At certain times of year, certain activities, it's the right time for them, for example, 
the graduation of a new cohort from, from uh, the education and training institutions. That's a key point in that annual cycle. And continuous quality improvement, research and development. This whole system is evidence-based and it's important to be testing the evidence and undertaking research and measuring and improving all the time, continuous quality improvement. So those are the success factors. This slide gives you a visual representation of the uh, remote rural workforce stability framework and, and with those, those tasks. Uh, so uh, plan, uh, recruit and retain each with their three components and then right in the center, the bullseye are the five conditions for success. Okay, so we've looked back uh, to the, the, uh, the policy and the recommendations in 1995, and we've, we've now reviewed what we know in terms of rural health and rural practice, practical uh, experience of implementing uh, the recommendations in that policy, and, and also what we know about recruitment and retention, the plan, recruit, retain framework. And here we are right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I, I would say there were many developments over the last 25 years that were not anticipated and, and predicted uh, when the policy was approved. And certainly this pandemic was not one of them. Even a year ago, I would say that uh, uh, most, if not all of us, really didn't see this coming. So this pandemic has brought into sharp focus uh, uh, existing in inequities and, and uh, uh, disparities, the fragility, the lack of the limited resources that, that rural communities and health services have to the point of civic leaders in the rural communities telling people to stay in the cities. So you can't escape the virus by coming to us because we don't have the resources to look after our own people if, if they become ill, let alone looking after outsiders. Um, and we also see the phenomenon of people avoiding accessing any health services for fear of, of, uh, uh, of the, the virus. And that of course then leads to other, other health issues. I would say as, uh, some positive messages from the experience are the importance of self-sufficiency and resourcefulness and really providing uh, the justification for renewed advocacy for investment of resources in health services, in communities, in rural and remote communities so that for the next crisis, pandemic or whatever it is, those communities and, the, and their services are well prepared to deal with, uh, with the issues at the local level and, and, and so therefore uh, not put extra pressure on, on the uh, higher level services that, that are in the big cities. And another observation that I've made anyway about the pandemic is that it's made the impossible possible. So yes, there was telehealth and yes, uh, you know, odd groups like the Wonka Working Party and Rural Practice. Rural Wonka, you know, been meeting uh, initially by audio teleconferencing, now by video conferencing as, as we are today. But in the big cities, that was seen as something, well, I suppose it's possible. Uh, it wouldn't be, you know, it's, an, it's, it's kind of a bit, bit doubtful, second class. But uh, now telehealth is, is normal. <laughs> And, and in fact, uh, accepted as, as a, a, a constructive co con contributor to healthcare everywhere. So that's an important part of, um, uh, of, of what we've learned and what the world knows. Similarly, uh, you know, this university I'm with now in New Zealand for the whole year, all of the coursework has been developed online and the, and the academic staff didn't see that as possible until they had to do it. So lots of positives as well as some of the major challenges that go with the pandemic. What we know now, uh, just to summarize what I presented, is rural medical education was a great idea back in 1995 and with a main focus on, on the uh, rural workforce. Now we know that the rural setting is a great place to learn clinical medicine. That, that the, there's an argument that all medical students and trainees should have some of their clinical learning in the rural setting because they learn so much and they learn so well. We also know that a facilitated career pathway, the rural generals pathway actually works. That was the idea in 1995. We now know that it really works. Starting in the high school, even in the primary school in the rural communities and encouraging the young people to see a future for themselves that might include healthcare and becoming doctors. And so that motivates them to study, get the grades, get into university, get into medical school. Um, and you need a, 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 the selection process to support that and, 
and uh, all of the other components right through, including once in practice support, transition to practice, uh, not just continuing education, professional development, but opportunities for graduate studies, masters and PhDs, so that the, that the, the, uh, the doctors and the other rural practitioners, they can pursue an academic career and, and progression in their career with, while staying in the rural setting and not having to move to the larger uh, cities. So we also know now that there are some real key commonalities uh, around the world. We found uh, with the Recruit and Retain Making It Work uh, project that we in the small remote rural communities in five countries with different languages, different cultures, we had more in common with each other than we had with, uh, with the people in the big cities in, in our own country. So across international borders, I've already highlighted education and training, recruiting from the remote rural communities, providing that training in the setting and supporting practice and active community participation. That is absolutely uh, the, the uh, key to success or one of the critical factors uh, in success is community engagement. So in conclusion, I would say that 25 years on, we're on a roll. We have the evidence. We, are, we have the momentum and now, especially thanks to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we have the opportunity to shape our own future. So looking to the next 25 years, I can see that if we work hard, if we keep going, if we maintain and, and increase the momentum, that in 25 years, all people living in, in remote and rural communities around the world will have access to high quality healthcare close to home. That's the end of my uh, keynote presentation. Uh, there are a, uh, some references for those who would like to, to follow up uh, what I've presented. In this slide also has my email address at the bottom for anyone who would like to make direct contact with me. And I'm sure that the organizers of the conference will make sure that you have access to my, uh, my a PDF of my PowerPoint slides. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And uh, I'm not sure who's speaking next is Zakur or Who's, who's, who do I hand over to? Bruce, over to Bruce. I think Thank Adnan you very much. I uh, wanted to make a comment. Yep, go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Roger Stretcher, for your keynote speech. Now, I would like to call very much a dynamic person, Dr. Bruce Charter. I will call Dr. Bruce Charter. Please welcome, Dr. Bruce Charter. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen and uh, hopefully that will all uh, come up properly. Uh, so thanks very much, Roger, for a, uh, an excellent introduction. Um, I'm Associate Professor Bruce Chater, Chair of, uh, of Rural Wonka, um, a rural academic and a rural family doctor providing comprehensive rural primary and secondary care uh, to my town of, uh, of Theodore in Australia. Um, you can just see uh, Bangladesh there on the other side, uh, uh, a bit further around the globe. Um, it's a great pleasure to set the scene for the next few days on behalf of, uh, of Rural Wonka Council. I wanted to, to uh, talk a little bit about the rural ethos. Um, uh, this 17th World Rural Health Conference hosted by our colleagues in Bangladesh exemplifies many of the aspects of, uh, of rural medicine, rural family medicine uh, that we hold self-evident. And that's a sense of community, common goals and experience. It's some collegiate goodwill and shared passion. It's closeness and caring, particularly to our community. It's persistence, rigor and scholarship. And I think Roger's shown that in large amount in his talk and youth and the future. So I want to deal with all of these one by one. First of all, sense of community, common goals and experience. As Roger said, this year we marked 25 years since the official establishment of Rural Wonka, the Wonka Working Party on Rural Practice. For those of you who don't know, Wonka is the world organization of national colleges and academies of general practice and family medicine. General practice and family medicine is a, tradition, uh, is a tradition of practice, really, based on generalism. 
And although most remarkably in this uh, day and age of megacities and uh, technology, it has its roots in the country doctor. And this was one of the classics of, uh, of looking at country doctors. In 1992, a young country doctor, Roger Strasser, who you just saw, who had recently added academic to his imperative, uh, impressive repertoire, uh, was at the Vancouver conference with a few colleagues. Um, Wes Fab, the founding CEO of Wonka, Nithya Nadu and Robert Hall. And that small group, uh, they weren't elected representatives of family practice colleges or they weren't just academics. They were passionate rural doctors who felt for their communities. Um, Wes was encouraging them to form a working party and what a wonderful working party it's turned out to be. Um, at the next conference, three years later in Hong Kong, a small group met, and you might recognise a few of them. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the first is uh, uh, John Wynne Jones on the left, then myself, Jim Rourke, Nithya Nadu, John McLeod, Tom Doolan across the back, and then Tariq Aziz, MJ Rajakuma, um, Roger Strasser, the young Roger Strasser, and uh, and Gu, uh, Gu Yuan. Uh, so they were pretty youthful faces back there. And I would just emphasize that uh, uh, these were young people really in those days, a lot of young people involved. And I think that's the tradition that we want to keep going. So this small team not only formed Rural Wonka, but within a year held the first national, international rather, rural medicine conference in Shanghai in 1996. Uh, you can see the, uh, the latest view of the Bund at that stage uh, in Shanghai. Um, at that conference, we found out, as Roger said, when you've seen one rural town, you've seen one rural town, but the challenges faced by rural doctors were common. Um, and we see this mutual understanding amongst rural doctors replicated so many times and no more than in the initiative of our Bangladesh colleagues who have come together to address these challenges in very practical ways. Uh, I know uh, uh, I'd love to come and see it someday, the Brahman Baria Medical College uh, uh, with Zakur and his colleagues. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it, they've done an amazing job there. So I'm very sorry that we can't, uh, we can't visit uh, at this stage. I'd like to talk also now about collegiate goodwill and passion. Uh, rural Wonka has flourished over the years because of passion. The members of Rural Wonka Council are all working rural doctors, students with a passion for rural academics or administrators who have a mission for rural. We are so pleased recently to include our nursing and midwifery colleagues. All these council members are closely linked to their communities and the family practice and rural doctor organisations in their countries. But they also have a passion to advocate for their local rural communities. We've seen this passion replicated in South Asia. Uh, the South Asia Conference of uh, South Asia region of Wonka has had a significant presence from Bangladesh and uh, we've uh, been honoured on Wonka to have Professors Nur al-Islam and, and Kanabalu uh, as prominent examples. A big thanks also to Raman Kuma who joins us tonight. Um, he's the uh, regional president uh, for, for South Asia and we very much appreciate his support. We've also seen this in the passion uh, with the formation of WARSA. Uh, thanks to WARSA for your support for this conference. This conference itself is brought to you by Primary Care and Rural Health Bangladesh. Um, and Zakur and his team of young rural doctors have worked tirelessly to ensure that this event is a success. Closeness and caring, particularly in, with communities and with the community of rural doctors is another characteristic of rural doctors. Rural doctors have been challenged by COVID and uh, many of our doctors 
have been victims of it. And this is a very sad uh, uh, collage of some of the, uh, the, the people who've been involved in, uh, in India. But despite this terrible toll, it's wonderful to see, especially the enthusiasm on the right of our young doctors to care for and support their colleagues and communities. Um, as rural doctors, we are close to our communities. We're also close as a family of rural doctors. Persistent rigour and scholarship, I think uh, uh, Roger's shown in spades, and I thank him uh, from the depth of my heart uh, as the first chair of, uh, of Rural Wonka. Um, we've addressed uh, this, as I said, uh, and Roger said, in a number of ways over the last 25 years. Um, as Roger mentioned, uh, we've had this, the establishment of a real body of academic knowledge and uh, uh, that's been very much a, uh, a work in progress, but I think it has stood the test of time and proven to be evidence-based. It was our South Asia colleagues from Pakistan, particularly Tariq Aziz, who you saw in that, uh, that very young photo, who challenged us some years ago to address the needs of lower and middle income countries. Uh, we took our common experience distilled in our policies and uh, those policies being training for rural general practice and rural practice and rural health and recently explored the literature in lower and middle income countries looking at how these measures are and can be implemented. Um, in doing so, we've developed a close relationship with WHO and developed with their support a checklist for rural pathways that's already been used in evaluating the future of rural health in Kyrgyzstan. So this very much is complementing the, um, the WHO uh, policies, the work that Roger's done, and a, and a, a raft of other stuff that is uh, being developed around the world. The other tangible commitment that we have made to this is ensuring that we support conferences in low and middle income countries. It's been a labour of love for our dedicated team, uh, both in council and in Bangladesh. And I'm sure you're in for a, uh, a treat this weekend. The final thing I'd like to talk about is uh, youth and the future. As I alluded before, Rural Wonka was formed by young people 25 years ago. Um, and we need the young students and young doctors of today to continue that tradition. We need our rural seeds to, glow, to grow and flourish. We need Mayara and her generation uh, as the future of rural medicine. One of the things that struck me uh, with uh, this conference is that Sakura has a very young team of passionate rural doctors and students. We're very grateful for their enthusiasm and the commitment of Zakir and his colleagues in primary care and rural health Bangladesh to take up the challenge. At first, it was going to be face-to-face -to, -face to now virtual of a World Rural Health Conference. So for today, I look forward to seeing on show these qualities of a sense of community, common goals and experience, collegiate goodwill and passion, closeness and caring, persistence, rigor and scholarship, and, and as I said, the youth and the future. The conference is not the same. We cannot see and enjoy the sights and sounds of rural Bangladesh in the same way that we would have with a face-to-face -face conference. But in fact, this virtual conference has allowed us to democratize the conference, allowing young and old, richer and poorer, from all around the world to join us. The conference is uh, not just today. It's, we've got not only this exciting program over the next three days, but also in the next four months, a series of recorded global leader presenta presentations in partnership with Network Towards Unity for Health, um, followed by case studies and webinars. So we'd want you, please, <coughs> to contribute case studies and come on to those webinars. We're gonna have the launch of another nine chapters of our Rural Medical Education Guidebook, and then two special Rural Seeds, Rural Cafes 
and finally a closing ceremony. So it is with great pleasure to be able to uh, join you at this conference. I look forward to sharing the celebration over this weekend and seeing the presentations and discussions unfold over the next few months. We have a very exciting time ahead. So thank you very much and I'll hand back to our colleagues. Thank you very much, Dr. Bruce Charter for your nice words. Brown Bay Medical College had been established by the year 2013. It was a dream project by a nobleman. He is none other than Dr. Abu Sayed, sir. I would like to welcome him and requesting to tell about his journey with primary care and rural health Bangladesh. Before his speech, uh, we enjoy a some small video about Dr. Abu Sayed, sir. Thank Good evening. Good evening to everybody who are participating in this occasion. I am delighted to share with you 17th Onka World Rural Health Conference hosted by Primary Care and Rural Health Bangladesh is now happening with huge enthusiasm. This is the first time in the history of Onka rural that it joins forces with Bangladesh to co-organize its conference as an, as an emphasis of the growing scope and expertise in Bangladesh. The theme of the conference is achieving rural universal health coverage through community approach. There are many suffering and deprivation of basic health care of in Bangladesh as a health to early disease and other healthcare facilities. There are many barriers to healthcare access in rural areas, such as distance and transportation, poor stigma, privacy issues, and so on. Distance and transportation is the most common barrier in all zones of rural population. This can be a significant burden in and time 
away from the workplace. Poor health literacy is another barrier for accessing health care. Health literacy impacts a patient's ability to understand health information and instructions from their health care providers. Social stigma and privacy issues are more likely to act as barriers to health care access. Rural residents have little concerns about seeking care for mental health. Sexual health, pregnancy, uh, and is or to overcome these barriers to provide primary health care to this rural population in Bangladesh. Along with emergency and public health services, primary care is the most basic and the most vital services needed in rural communities. It provides health promotion, disease prevention, health maintenance, counseling, patient education, diagnosis, and treatment of acute and chronic illness in a variety of healthcare settings. Now, we are giving special attention to primary health care in rural areas to control the spread of disease and reduce the growing rates of mortality. I believe we can do it if we work together. I am happy to announce that we already established rural health centers and rural health training center, which is generously provided by our professor, Dr. Jakir Rahman. We have established Corona Isolation Unit with 100 beds separated both male and female in Brahmanbury Medical College. And we also established a PCR lab also. We need to encourage young doctors and arrange training for rural healthcare professionals. I would like to express my utmost sincere gratitude to thank Dr. Jakir Rahman, the program chairman of this conference and this team. And I also like to thank our principal, Professor Brigadier General Mohammed Muhammad Shafiqul Islam and other um, personals of this um, institute. Thank you all. Keep up the great work. Enjoy the conference. And thank you all. And good evening again. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abusay, sir, for sharing your speech with us. Now we enjoy. Uh, now we enjoy the journey of primary care and rural health Bangladesh by a small video.